I want to show you this, like, totally cool bar. If only I could remember where it is. Here it is! Behind this tropical fish shop! I mean, why is that? I mean, is it just because people are, are lazy today or they're bored? I mean, are we just like bored, spoiled children who've just been lying in the bathtub all day, just playing with their plastic duck, and now they're just thinking, well, what can I do? Okay, yes, we are bored. We're all bored now. But has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money, and that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks? And it's not just a question of individual survival, Wally, but that somebody who's bored is asleep, and somebody who's asleep will not say no? See, I keep meeting these people. I mean, uh, just a few days ago, I met this man whom I greatly admire. He's a Swedish physicist, Gustav Bjornstrand. And he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines. He's completely cut them out of his life because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now and that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. When I was at Findhorn, I met this extraordinary English tree expert who had devoted his life to saving trees. Just got back from Washington, lobbying to save the redwoods. He's 84 years old. He always travels with a backpack because he never knows where he's going to be tomorrow. And when I met him at Findhorn, he said to me, where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York. Yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? I gave him different banal theories. He said, oh, I don't think it's that way at all. He said, I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride in this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made, or to even see it as a prison. And then he went into his pocket and he took out a seed for a tree and he said, this is a pine tree. He put it in my hand and he said, escape before it's too late. See, actually for two or three years now, Chiquita and I have had this very unpleasant feeling that we really should get out. And we really should feel like Jews in Germany in the late 30s. Get out of here. Of course, the problem is where to go because it seems quite obvious that the whole world is going in the same direction. See, I think it's quite possible that the 1960s represented the last burst of the human being before he was extinguished. And that this is the beginning of the rest of the future now. That from now on, there'll simply be all these robots walking around, feeling nothing, thinking nothing. And there'll be nobody left almost to remind them that there once was a species called a human being with feelings and thoughts. And that history and memory are right now being erased, and soon nobody will really remember that life existed on the planet. Hey, do you do like, like a lychee capriasca? journey back in time with Howarth and Crawley to the 11th century. Monks travelled throughout Europe, Scotland and Ireland, spreading the word of God, distillation and fashion. Have you got time for a chat about Jesus? Fork off! The Irish and Scots started making spirits at roughly the same time, thanks to the Crusades and the medicinal trade routes from North Africa. First, let's take a closer look at Ireland, the Emerald Isle. Irish legend has it English King Henry invaded Ireland in 1170 and found locals drinking whiskey long before the Scots. 
Uh, give me that tasty looking beverage or you'll feel the wrath of my anarchal self-perpetuating autocracy. Irish whiskey will never be yours. Leave my spiritus autonomous collective alone, you bastard. So there you have it. The birth of the argument of who created whiskey first. Tuesday, bloody Tuesday. Tuesday, bloody Tuesday. Ahem. <clears throat> No politics on board, chaps. Ireland's tumultuous story with whiskey begins with formal taxation by the English in Drogheda in 1556. This became more aggressive in the form of the famous malt tax of 1682. The malt tax defined the category of Irish pot still whiskey. The Irish distillers added a little unmalted barley, not only to dodge the taxes, but to irritate London Parliament. Let's save some fucking money here and put some of this unmalted barley in. That should fucking light them up, the fuckers. Love your work, Paddy. By 1830, Ireland could boast over 2,000 working distilleries, which formed part of the larger city centre. Their output was staggering. Irish whiskey was adored the world over. Even the Scots were drinking it. This is why it's argued that the Irish pot still style introduced the world to whiskey, <coughs> not the Scots. Building on this momentum, Irishman Aeneas Coffey invents a new way to increase output with his groundbreaking continuous still, which he takes to the Irish distillers. They resolutely rejected it on the grounds of its efficient and inferior liquid that they call the silent spirit. What the fuck are you doing on earth? God has given us the skills to drive these here pots, and you want us to buy a fucking machine? Go and try selling it to the filthy fucking Scots. Ireland's decision to reject paint and stills became the first in a series of devastating blows which destroyed Irish whiskey's pre-eminent footing. The second blow to the Irish was in 1838, with the temperance movement recruiting over three million people. This is shortly followed by the potato famine in 1845, which decimated Ireland with one million dead and one million fleeing, many to Scotland. The next series of blows were global and political. In 1909, Silent Spirit is ratified as whiskey, and by 1914, World War One hits hard. In 1922, Irish gain independence, but in turn lose trading privileges with the British Empire. By the 1920s, most Americans preferred Irish over Scotch whiskey, so the onset of prohibition really took its toll. During Hitler's charge in 1939, the Irish had no capacity to produce commercial quantities of alcohol for the war effort. All grain distilling licenses are awarded to Scotland and the Irish are forced to close down all their distilleries. By the 1950s and 60s, the 2,000 Irish distilleries were reduced to four, with three later deciding to merge, leaving Irish whisky in a static holding pattern for over four decades. Let's leave the luck of the Irish now and have a look back at Scotland. Scotland's first written reference to distillation is captured in 1494 on an order from King James IV to Friar John Corr. Hamish, another order's arrived. The pissed wants more this time. Eight bowls of malt. When whisky goes into black glass in 1860, this one order would amount to over 1,500 bottles. From this, it's clear whisky is in great demand, and its production is still firmly the domain of monks and monasteries. In 1530, Pope Clement VII denies Henry VIII to divorce. Hey, no new jiggy jiggy for you. These fucking pigs, what's the point of being king if one cannot relish in a good old fashioned gang bag? In a fit of rage, Henry creates the Church of England and seizes churches, burns monasteries, and tortures the monks. And secretly marries a new hot lady who later fails to provide a son unless he has her beheaded. Any surviving monks went into hiding they resorted to a life of trading and teaching distillation to farmers. Ah, oh, thanks, honorable monk. I knew you were really hot to the island this year. My monkey brain was, ah, oh, damn it, it's not just here. I'm a girl, this is not a lot of time, I feel sensational. Now my dad's here, this kind of self-exclusive, all right? Poor man, this is going to be high. 
You're not so bad yourself. As this all took hold, by the end of the 16th century, barley crops became known as the drink crop, with one third of all land devoted to growing it. At the turn of the century, Scottish weather delivers a grain failure. Distillation is banned to save the precious grain for food. Farmers begin illicit distilling for an emerging black market. The highlands were a smuggler's paradise. Signalling across mountaintops was easy. Some smugglers trained dogs to run whiskey-filled pig's bladders. Some ran for it with belly canteens, and some even hid in cows. They'll never find me in here. This illicit trade quickly got out of hand. This all changed when a Scot became the King of England in 1603. I have been charged to bring the Highlands into civility. At once, ban all Gaelic practice, kidnap clan chiefs, and send the firstborns to English schools. And someone deal with that bloody ginger gene. Scotland collapses in 1707, giving birth to Great Britain in the Act of Union. All right, boys. As the early 1700s unfolded, private and commercial taxable distilleries started to pop up. During 1735 to 37, production tripled. Whiskey beta, as it was then commonly known, was drunk straight from the still and not matured until well into the 19th century. London's gin craze led to the Gin Act of 1736, effectively banning the production of gin. The Gaelic word of whiskey beta was not recognised as an English word, therefore avoiding the act. This gave the Scots a boost as they started selling whiskey beta in great quantity to the desperate gin distillers in London. The definition confusion was quickly rectified in 1755 when whiskey beta was included in the first English dictionary. Now that that bloody clumsy word is recognised by the English, it was open to heavy tax and the return to illicit distilling. From 1816 to 1820, 14,000 illegal stills were discovered, 400 in Edinburgh alone. Throughout the 1820s and 30s, a succession of royal visits to Scotland gives rise to a wider appreciation of all things Scotland especially for the sporting classes. This dram would be fit to replace our beloved cognac. Have you not tasted this? Lift the Gaelic bands immediately, and for God's sake, get the Scottish kids out of our schools. Huiskia Beta finally goes legit in 1823, and the word Huiskia transforms into whiskey. No longer a tax fugitive, it is stored in wooden barrels for the first time, allowing ageing to take hold. The Scots weren't home yet. The sporting classes preferred Irish whisky for its consistent smoothness, as the Scottish single whisky suffered inconsistency from regional differences. <laughs> to compete with the Irish, some blending was needed. The Gladstone Spirits Act in 1853 allowed private distillers to sell their whisky to larger merchants for blending. This shift away from single whiskies saved Scots from extinction, with the blending of just 13 patent stills producing 7 million gallons per year. By 1860, blended whisky sees glass bottles for the first time, and Scotch whisky is placed on a firm commercial footing with iconic names such as Teachers, Matthew Glogue and Sons, and the Macallan. As the 20th century unfolds, we see two world wars, prohibition, a depression, the age of corporate mergers and Japanese buyouts putting whiskey under ever-increasing pressure. Changes in post-war culture and lifestyle choices gave way to wine bars, vodka, white rum, and the Midori fucking splice. The Scotch whisky industry identified these changing tastes and in 1988 focused all their energies on promoting the regionality, wood finishing and the specific ages of single malts. Ireland is currently enjoying an even stronger renaissance with renewed interest in Irish pot still whisky. The hub of creativity, now being driven by Coolies and Kilbegan, 
With some double pot distillation, single grain and a pleated malt, Irish whiskey is enjoying its overdue revival. This, this has, has been, been Mixing Chronicles Scotch and, and Irish, Irish whiskey. whiskey. No Irish star to grew teeth during the making of this film. All couture is violence, sex scenes were imagined, and Mel Gibson's last scene blending antisemitic single malt. <laughs>